recording. Okay, okay so. so. That's me. Okay. Uh, we're good. We're good. Let's continue. 120 design lessons. Uh, in the chat box, please uh, put in the link to today's doc. Uh, so let's open that up. So do you see how the you see the link the chat in the chat box? So yeah, you can uh, take a look at that. So that that's day seven. There's a chat box open in its upper left corner. Is the chat bubble there? Open that up. Uh, click on that. Okay. So let's let's do it. Let's do it today. I want want to cover a couple of things. Level of detail. Level, like actually level of design. It's a new word I heard the other day. And then talk about foundation and then talk about the uh, exercise on a, on a collaboration what we started yesterday. Let's see if we can get a hang of it so uh, all of us can do that effectively and review that. Uh, yesterday I did not see any other ones pop into the final uh, positionally correct document. I'm not sure if people saved, saved the things in a positionally correct. It wasn't added yet, but let's let's see if we can get that workflow going. So on Tuesday, I heard the word call, called level of design. So we were talking to the architects from BNIM, and BNIM, and they were like, so we told them, yeah, we're actually getting all the complete detail down to every screw and bolt. And I said, oh, that's BIM level 500. Oh yeah, wow, impressive, because they don't people don't do that a lot. But what that means is that you have absolute complete detail. If you click on that LOD 500 link, uh, take a look at that. It's an article on a wiki, stands for level of development. Let's click on the, on the first, first one. Uh, so the first one, it, it basically says how much detail you have from a conceptual to a detail, to more detail to a fully technically correct kind of a system and it, and it measures the geometry, the accuracy, the information. So 100, let's see, like 100 is typically like conceptual. Let's see, where does it say that um, outline, quick outline of what it is? Let me look at the other link there because that might have a better. Uh, and what's the significance of that? Because there's a point to that. Did you want to share your screen? Ah, yes. Sharing the screen. Okay, so sharing the screen, uh, take a look at the level of detail. Uh, there's one document is here, and the other other window there's um, from website called United BIM. So levels of development, that's effectively how much detail you have put into your your drawing or your CAD. So the five trees up on above there kind of represent okay rough sketch to absolutely fully detailed to every leaf. Um, but uh, let's see, do they have a quick, yeah, there it is. It's the quick, quick overview of what the levels are. So concept is something called level of, it's called level of design because I want to make a distinction between level of it's, uh, development, not, not design, but develop, level of development versus level of detail. Because it doesn't necessarily mean that the highest level of development has the the highest level of detail in terms of cons in terms of actual geometries. So, but let's go through it. So, so LD is just concept, approximate for 200, 300 is precise, 350 precise geometry with connections. So you can't just do the CAD. Like right now, we're doing a CAD. We haven't done anything about how the the panels come together. 400 is fabrication ready geometry. And 500 is operational as built model. So that is, um, so after we actually build it, we would, we would get to 500 because we're probably going to make some changes. So the 500 level is much more about interfaces, how things work together um, as built. But sometimes the, like I was reading this other article on the, the other one, LOD 500 explained, and it says that the 500 level does not necessarily have to have the most complete geometrical detail it could be the things that are relevant to the client like for us it'll be all the extra information how you build it and to us 500 
as built models, we're really putting in information on how to run enterprise on it. We might not even uh, at that level, if people know how to, if, if, if the knowledge of the modules is elsewhere, like we don't need, like for example, use case, we all learned it. We learn, learned well how to build the house. Then the final LOD 500 document would be that we're actually not putting in the, the level of detail that we have right now, absolutely everything, but more like, uh, here's the workflows, here's how you organize the build process. That would be important for us in terms of the execution of what we actually do as the clients, the, the people who are using this design. So as we're developing, we go to the fab ready geometry is like 400. The 500 is how it fits together, how do you make it happen? And for people who maintain it, how they would maintain it, stuff like that. So it's just an interesting point. There's a technical term here, like when we talk to the building people is, um, because a lot of CAD out there may be just 100, which is conceptual. So, so, but if you understand how it's how it's built, like now you're getting details of how how you're actually building all the modules and there's fasteners and all that, you'll be able to recognize which is which has got missing pieces and which doesn't. So it's just this level of awareness, and there are technical terms that describe this. So that's good. And um, when I did talk to the architect, they said, "Yeah, oh wow, LOD 500 BIM, Building Information Modeling, level of the." development now level of detail that's the the other article makes a distinction between that level of detail right that says um, can take a look at that where does it say that yeah 500 is detail level of detail and they give you some examples there but detail like the the final as built if the person knows how to build it. You don't necessarily have to put in all the all the detail. Like architects don't put all that detail because they assume that the builders know how to build it. So that's just something fun. Okay, well, let's move on to uh, foundation design. So go on to the second page, and let's go through what we're doing on a foundation, which is already in place. But I want to describe to you what what has happened there and visually too. So uh, if you click on this this document there. Um, let's go through what has happened because this is what we will build for September and you guys all will be part of that. Um, so let's go to, to page one for uh, maybe here, here, let's start here. So this is actually what we did. So we had a, a pad that was graded uh, bigger than the house. It was 32 by 64 because the house is only thir uh, 32 by 16 but what I did there out out there was 32 by 64 because you got to work around it like you don't just drop the house off at 32 by 16 you have to have a little bit of slope actually it's like 10 feet of slope of drainage so that the water goes away from it so I had to do that first thing is get the string out there mark the corners put the gravel in the middle of that pile so the choices here are, well, you do have to do considerable earth moving if you're on, on uneven ground for the step one for the grading part. So you get a heavy machine out there like a tractor or dozer or backhoe. You have a pile of gravel, you lay out the, the, for, the string for the corners and then put in all the gravel because the gravel is, uh, you want to have a few inches of gravel. Uh, so that's what we did. We made forms. So, so here we've got the pile of gravel in the middle, the forms on the outside, and we dig down just a little bit. So the forms are about eight inches tall. So we had to dig down still like, like six or t we had to get to 18 inches altogether for a shallow frost protected footer. Um, so we dug down that those, those ditches are, and I'll show pictures of this. At a certain point when we had the gravel in there, we put in the plumbing, and I'll show you that. Uh, and then we leveled off the, basically leveled off with a scree board, we leveled the gravel so, so that the, the thickness of the concrete would actually be about three and a half or four inches, just four inches. So basically a long board. Then we put the rebar, that's this next picture here. Uh, and finally inserted the insulation and the concrete anchors in red so the insulation went actually inside uh, on the inside of the forms and then well that's about it so let's let's take a look at let me see what else I want to show here uh, some of the this is actually the side cut 
detail if we want to take a look at what's actually going on there. So the, the foundation, that's what is represented there. Underneath the foundation, you have polyethylene. So that's a vapor barrier because otherwise, if you don't have that polyethylene underneath it, your concrete will be sweating. It will be transmitting moisture. Like on cold days, you'll have all this water on your floor. So in, in your house, like you'd have water because water goes through concrete. So you have to have that vapor barrier. It's sitting on a gravel, like four inches of gravel. The insulation is on the outside. And what we framed in for the foundation was level with, uh, you see the top of the concrete there. Well, there's still a little chunk of uh, insulation that sticks up on top of there. And we actually add that. But the bottom uh, sill plate, the one, the, this thing here with my cursor, that's on the 16 by 32 edge. The anchors, which are those metal pieces embedded in the concrete that kind of wrap around. So right now we have these anchors. Let me let me sh see if I have the anchors here somewhere. Um, anchors. Don't really see them, but the anchors are these metal pieces that are stuck. Uh, these metal pieces that are stuck and right now they're they're horizontal they're going out like this and then we wrap them around the bottom the bottom is going to be a two by four and the one above that is going to be a two by six so the exterior panel hangs over the insulation underneath the the exterior plywood is still weather weather barrier that's your house wrap and there's also this piece of um, vinyl flashing this thing this kind of shape it's actually vinyl it's flexible vinyl so we stick that through on the back side of the wall underneath above the top plate and above the cement board so currently the status is we've got the insulation on the outside that's what's there right now up to this point here next step is we've got these strips of the cement board so that bugs or insects don't eat up your insulation. Uh, insulation is quite frail. Uh, rodents would eat it and house in there. So we stick the cement board, which is a mixture of cement and it's got some fiberglass threading through it. It's a, it's a cement material that does not rot. So it goes underneath about six inches. So you're protecting that from, from rodents and critters. And then the grade uh, you bury back. So right now we've got maybe like eight, eight or ten inches around the foundation. So we'll dig down just like a couple inches and insert the cement board in there. So that's our, some of our next steps. And uh, so let's just get to the pictures of how this all looks in real life. So um, the, the, it's a good reality check to have the reality. That's live track. We're clearing out some trees. I actually saved a bunch of these trees. Um, to uh, cut with a sawmill if we if we get that going. And here's the pile. That's that's actually behind there. That's that's actually at the site, just a little south. I put all this lumber down there. Uh, so then stake out the foundation. Start staking this thing. So you put in. So this is like the 60 by 30 or so. Uh, had to clear out a few stumps there you start stringing it up uh, this was uh, like November December time Just trying to figure out what to do here it's kind of you have to uh, there's a laser level down there I use that to uh, having that just sit on either on the ground or on on its box the laser level shoots a line you have a little detector and gets you exactly the height of the the string that will be the top of the forms later on so here just working through that until sunset and then at the end you've got your you put in your wooden forms like this then you string it across so this is uh, forms are loose 16 by 32 screwed together uh, bound together with a piece of wood right there and then bound together with a piece of wood right there uh, oh no that should be a single 16 I just had two eights but this is uh, a two by eight so it's about eight inches it's actually seven a little over seven so here we're taking after the initial stakes were put in measure across and then 
Um, make sure the two corners, the measurement on those two corners is identical. And if that measurement is identical, that means you actually have a, a perfectly square foundation. You cannot, if you have a you know, rectangular shape and you make a measurement around the corners, you cannot get the same measure, measurement and not be square. That's just basic geometry. Like if you're skewed, the two measurements will be different. And the more skewed you are, the more the difference. So I got it down to, I mean, that was within a quarter inch or like really pretty tight. Uh, but what I did there was put the, <laughs> there's the laser level spinning there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh yeah. Laser level spinning there. Um, and I'm raising and lowering the edges so that the laser, like I, I, I measure with the laser, or like I could s maybe see the laser, probably using the uh, laser detector. Uh, but I think I, I set the strings to the right place already, and I'm s just a bu bunch of messing around with this. Just make sure it's all equal on all sides. And then the cat runs by again. And so, so I'm basically getting it equal with a string. Like, But don't put the string on it because you don't know where if the string is touching you might think it's level but it's actually already resting so so keep the string like a half an inch above so you make sure that you're still uh, level there and then at the end of it the sun sets so then you dump the gravel in there so that's that's our pad um, so with the life track I took there was a pile of gravel there and I just dumped it with the life track before the wood was there because otherwise I could not you have to have a particular procedure first to well, this, so this actually should have been before because I already showed this step here. So maybe uh, I should actually dump gravel. That was before. Control X. So stake it, dump the gravel, measure across. Uh, but I'm still showing how we're dumping the gravel. And what's what could be interesting to note here, and let's see, any other notes. Uh, protected it with a tarp because it was you know, rainy. Um, and this is the hard part. Like once you have the gravel in there, uh, if you want to drive over that, I mean, I can't just take the tractor in. The tractor is too big, but maybe the micro track would be a good thing. Maybe put a little ramp over this, so I don't have to do this all manually. That's this is hard work. I mean, just you know, a bunch of tons of gravel, um, a full truckload of gravel. So it's you know, you could definitely appreciate a uh, some mechanical assist there, unless you've got a large team that that works. But this is it's kind of hard work uh, to do this. You yep. Uh, you don't dig trenches around. Yeah, yeah, we do. So that's let's look at some of that next. Um, there is a trench. So the idea there is, if you look at the actual design and kind of the rough sketch here, that's going down. The grade is right there at the bottom of the gravel. That's where we graded to, even with the gravel. So this part we still have to go down uh, to make it. Well, actually the. Uh, the rules are there's 12 inches below grade and 6 inches above so if we've got 4 inches of gravel here and a 4 inch of foundation that's 8 inches then I still have to dig 10 inches down uh, but a person with a shovel could rel could pretty much do that at this small scale but that's very hard work you know digging down 10 inches um, and you basically do what you can like I didn't get it 10 inches everywhere uh, I used the auger uh, just a post hole auger so yeah digging uh, spreading the gravel and then starting to dig around the entire foundation um, so then you build the plumbing and the plumbing is super simple but the rough in is this you know we built it we glued it up inside we've got uh, this is for the toilet this is for the shower and this actually uh, Ex is going to extend for the extended plumbing to the second floor. So we're the way we're designing it right now, we're going to actually add on to this. So we're going to break. This is where the t tub, the shower drains into here and the sink is going to drain into here. This is the toilet here. But this pipe here is going to extend up and go to the second floor, floor because we're pre-plumbing for an addition of to a 2000 square foot house with a bathroom on an upper floor. So we're making it designed for expansion. And all you do there is, I had some acetone and glue, PVC glue, this is PVC. Uh, it's something we can 3D print. If we've got the large printers, we can print this whole thing, like print this geometry in one piece. Um, 
It only takes about an hour or two to, to glue this together. Not too much. Uh, if you know what you're doing, it's like an hour or two. Maybe it took us all like four hours to put this together the first time. Um, so then you insert the plumbing. So plumbing went in like this, like there had to dig dig a little bit here. Now you see the that shovel and yeah, the trench is partially dug there. Uh, I did what I could and then you just mark out the location exactly. And I'm going off the CAD right there. I'm saying, okay, the plumbing has to be exactly there for it to fit. So this is like digital design getting in there, though it looks uh, pretty much like redneck territory. <laughs> but I used that auger, um, as you saw the little auger, uh, I took that out and tried to dig and get as much assist because it's hard soil and uh, it was compacted with a tractor by riding over it back and forth a bunch of times. So that's how that process um, looks. Can I say something on that? Yeah. Um, whenever I built the plumbing on houses, instead of doing gravel, they did sand. Yeah. And then the sand is really easy to uh, yeah to to work with. I mean, you would compact like you have there before you put the gravel and then you put sand in and then you dig the sand and you would start from from this position and then run it out and you would just do the crack of a bubble and run it out as yeah. you go you backfill the sand tamp with the handle of, of the shovel yeah so that you're good and firm until mm -hmm. you get it all in and then you backfill and tamp around it and you're, yeah this so gravel there's, diff there's different ways of doing it so I don't see too much block with the gravel. It's it's pretty easy to work with. Sand would be even easier. The hardest part was maybe digging a little bit under, like here where it extends out. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit below grade. Um, it doesn't have to be frost proof, but it actually will be frost proof right outside because we're laying that insulation, mm -hmm. uh, which I'll show later. So um, inserted the plumbing, kind of got that in really tight, buried it with gravel. Uh, so there it is buried like and the water line the blue water line is also coming out there You see that stub over there of the water line uh, They're both coming out there. And I put a box around that so that once you pour pour the concrete you're pouring up to it and um, Inserting insulation here is that happening? Yeah. Oh, yeah, so so here we start There we go uh, so the the trenches dug all around, and that was the hard work here. That's like you know, just so. Are you leaving that open where the box is, or is yeah, that it's open. The no, that's open. The concrete goes up to it, and the concrete goes up to the the waste pipe there. Uh, so see, inserting the insulation, go all the way down to where the bottom of the. So just cutting it with a knife, and inserting it level with the foundation on the inside of the forms. So one of the side effects of that is your forms are protected from the concrete. Uh, so we can reuse the forms. Forms are very simple, just the two stakes and a horizontal. Did you put oil in the forms or anything, or just plain board? No oil in the forms. It's just just that because the insulation covers it, so you don't have to do it. Um, oh, the, storm, the form stayed in? Well, the insulation stays in. The concrete goes to the insulation, and you take off the forms. We save oh, the forms. Oh, oh, okay. So the concrete is going against the, the insulation. insulation. So yeah. So you insulation is on the inside, so you don't need the Correct. hole. <laughs> um, so that's kind of how it went. Um, and yeah, this is uh, with a one person doing that it's a bit of work. So at the end, you go scree the gravel, like I mentioned before. You take a long board, and once you kind of smooth out the gravel, um, that take this long board and get it because it's got a two by four like three and a half it pretty much gets you like three and a half or four inches um, I'm doing that with one person by putting a stake on one end and just moving it a few inches shoving it over a little bit and so forth um, until and continuing continuing and the end, we're pretty much ready to put in the polyethylene, the vapor barrier, above the, the screed gravel. Then we weigh it down, we put rebar stakes on the long sides and remesh, which is the mesh of rebar that you start seeing coming in here. That mesh, put on little stones. It kind of 
it kind of all falls down when you walk on it when you actually pour so you kind of have to pull it up and um, make it keep off the ground once you're doing the pour so the next step is you're ready for the pour so where was your rebar so in here <clears throat> the rebar is all all around the perimeter so you got two strands of rebar one above the other half inch rebar all a, all around do you make a chair for that or we actually hung it um we didn't chair it it was i think hung um how do we do it oh yeah yeah we actually start stuck vertical rods just little rebars along the edge and tied it to it so you so we had so you went you hammered it in through the through the plastic through the plastic and then then you just tied to that so you got yeah tied to the like little stakes like i show mm -hmm. here uh where i'm holding the scree bar uh hung it on that okay. and now we're ready for the pour which is good enough so we start so we're just finishing this up this was and the truck arrives right there already and we're starting to pour so we're like in the nick of time just have to do it. it was a long long night uh, before that just trying to prepare for that so now here we're just smoothing it out we pour it in smooth it out that's easy first step is the scree board just to get it roughly even and I was doing that uh, use this long piece of metal um, well, the two pieces of metal like that to, to use that as a scree board, um, and that works works fine. Uh, but with two, you want to probably have a couple more people here. This is you know, when you're doing this. Oh, it's completely doable. Like if you had a good night's sleep, this would be a nice hard day. I didn't have a lot of sleep that night, so I was pretty <laughs> fatigued because we we had to get this in by the time. Uh, so this is a float it's called a magnesium float and now you're getting that second level this is after screening it you're getting it smooth it kind of punches all the rocks down because there's rocks in the concrete there's gravel and sand in the concrete it punches it down and uh, what's it do it kind of what's a float do it's kind of makes the water it starts making the water come out of the concrete stuff like that. that's the first step um, and then the second step is a trowel so now we're starting to trowel it. You see the small hand trowel and this bigger one on a handle, that gets it nice and smooth. And at this level, since this takes a bit of time, I would like to have a power trowel. That would be good. It's a thing that you walk behind it and it spins. Well, at this point, it's still too wet to walk on. But after you do this initial troweling, now to get it nice, like really, really nice and smooth, the, actually, the shop floor is pretty nice and smooth. I think they use the power trowel there. But here, uh, we just had this equipment. And then I spent like all night a few hours. Like so, so it got dark by like 5. And then I'm out there till like 8, just doing it by hand. I wish I had a power trowel at that point. Because <laughs> you can just keep working the concrete forever and getting it more and more smooth. A power trowel, which is a rotating blade. It's, a, it's an engine with a rotating, rotating blade. Um, yeah, float and trowel. So the pour happened at the same time. The float, the magnesium float happened, and then once you can trowel the first, like initially, and then you can walk on it pretty much, and you can power trowel it so that you erase that float part. Uh, trowel. What do we have there? Um, yeah, troweling to finishing the troweling here. So it's like the second half. Night sets. We put on like you see there. We put. It's still wet enough that you put like something to walk on because it will sink on you. So, and then from this time, just got the car lights on, drained the battery, and you know, just did this all like for a long time because you see how it's you know it's rough in places. The car lights make make you see that, <coughs> and just working it uh, just for a long time there until uh, Katrina told me to go home. It's good enough. <laughs> And then you take off the foundation forms at the end of the day. So you've got this finished pour. This is what it pretty much looks like right now. You got to start by taking off the forms. There was a lot of spill of concrete that we kind of had to ram out on the other side. There's a bunch of concrete blocks there because uh, we just had a little bit too much concrete. It spilled. You want to like really measure it nicely so you don't have all this cleanup at the end of the day. Did you take it off the next day or how long did you wait? Uh, we waited for a bit of time because this is like in the spring now once the grass is growing so it's a month or two after mm -hmm. um, but yeah and you see those uh, anchor anchors for the the sill plate and that's going to be the outer edge 
where the 2x4 goes on top of the foundation, the 2x6. So if you go to this detail, um, if you go to the foundation detail there, uh, I think the, the most important thing to keep in mind, like we're kind of doing a complicated thing with the 2x4 and the 2x6. And that's because um, the detail there is kind of tricky. Because uh, let's let's talk about the detail. Because if we wanted to use, we could have used anchors that come up straight through the concrete, but then you have to bury them in the concrete and work around them. So the only challenge about these anchors that you anchor. So let's look at this sketch, the side profile here. Um, if you look at this. This detail. Um, how else would you do it? Uh, can we just? Well, you cannot extend. See this block here, because the anchors have to be have to finish at the foundation edge. So this is the anchor. It's actually stuck into the ground. When we build the foundation, the anchor is is laying flat across here, so you can actually travel around it without any interference. Otherwise, you have bolts in here that you just spend a bunch of time going around them because the bolts would hold the the sill plate uh, holes through the sill plate now that's pretty complicated we want to in this digital housing 2.0 we want to take every single detail and make sure we're not adding work for the the bolts through the concrete one you're spending more time traveling around the bolts that are inset into the concrete you better make sure you got that measure it out properly and stuff like that so there's more measuring there uh, while you're pouring so you know you got too many details happening at one time and then you still have to drill through the the the, the two by four lumber at a precise location otherwise you miss the hole so that's a lot of time that we save by using this they're called mud sill anchors um, if you google mud sill anchor that's what they look like the bottom edge is stuck this is what we use actually uh, one of these things um, so the bottom curved part there goes into the concrete and this part here with the holes wraps around the wood and you you screw through the holes so now you've got a concrete to metal to wood connection that's very strong that's all code approved and all of that so that's that mud sill anchor now if we use that mud sill anchor, you notice that we could not just use a two by six down there all the way out because you don't have enough. They don't make them for um, like this piece that bends up around the wood is only so long. So if we had a two by six down there, it would not, you can't wrap it around. So we had to do this weird detail here where we use a two by four and then a two by six. Now that's still good. It's it's something you might want to check on the codes, but I don't think there's any issues with that because people typically build with two by four walls. That's very common. So here we've got, yeah, we've got a little bit of hanging over, what but is we're the still got. Of that now exactly? I'm still which honest. part? Of one, you have a two by four, and then your two by six is sitting on top of that. I try to explain that the two by six would not fit here. If you want to put a two by six here, yeah, you can put it there. Okay, so let's draw over this. We so can do, if we wanted to do what you're suggesting, we do this and then put our wall panel on here, right? Just put the wall there. The, your sheathing needs to go over the exterior insulation. That's the purpose. Yeah, you got a water problem there. If you had this insulation up here, that's a kind of ledge yes. that you can get water okay. in there. I see that. So that's just the detail. So you want to be around that. That's one of the critical elements just water infiltration and make sure you're tight over there so below the sill the sill plate is going to be a gasket for air and moisture and above it we're going to put a sill gasket and uh, yeah just one below and one above and that's treated wood the bottom is treated the above that where we have our panels that's not treated mm -hmm. we're building regular regular panels so that's a basic explanation of the the house foundation uh, does anyone have any questions on it? The, 
the, the thing to figure out there is like think about it this way foundations are typically hard I mean they're you got earth moving in order to minimize that we build up the forms on the ground we're digging minimally we just have to go down enough so we get an 18 inch uh, distance on a footer the the thickened footer but otherwise we're building up four inches of gravel and we're using forms that are like almost eight inches above the ground so we've got minimal digging in this condition and you can think about all kinds of other ways okay you got to put in a foundation you got to do 18 inches well it's easier to build up than to dig down so putting gravel on is a convenient way to do it and we looked at uh, some other I think I documented some other things we were I think probably towards the end uh, went through like a couple of iterations on this uh, but I think at first yeah so this is at the very end I would expect to have like I'm working from the newest document on top but at first we were thinking this and this is actually relevant because you'll think about this when you're actually starting this so this is what I thought at first I said no -uh, no that's not what okay so what's got what's going on here so one we were discussing just dig down for your footer that's it with a backhoe well that's completely ridiculous well it's not super ridiculous because you only have to dig down that eight inches so you don't necessarily well the backhoe would, would help like when it, uh, but one option is you dig down we kind of dismiss that idea because okay let's build up instead because it's easier just to dig soil and, and pile it up huh. you have to look at all the details but at first we were thinking okay there's 14 inches that we're going to build up with a with a tractor well if you're starting on flat ground uh, it's effectively what we did but not in this way the, the idea is we did not build up this bunch of soil here we kept it flat um, because the detail will be here if you do this kind of do this kind of earthworks then what you have ended up with if you took the soil from here from the sides that means you'd have a moat you'd have a low area which will always be wet unless you get the soil from somewhere else so what we ended up doing so so like you know this extends out but then if this was great initially then it kind of goes up after that and it doesn't have drainage so that's just a detail like when you when you look into doing it so what we ended up doing is digging that pond that you see south well you didn't necessarily see it there's a pond a small pond south of the house we piled up all the soil so you have proper drainage and then that's our flat point and we built the foundation up from there here what we're implying is that we're building up the foundation around soil that we built up there already but it's you got to massage that soil and and sculpt it it's much easier to start flat put some gravel on top and then dig your footers on the outside so that was the evolution but we started on thinking oh man that's how are we gonna ha get the equipment to or you know there's some equipment time there and then you have to dig through all that soil for the um, what you see there for the plumbing so you built it up and then you dig in again for the plumbing mm -hmm. so if you really think about it like this is actually the the difference between what I'm showing here and what we actually did is night and day in terms of the amount of time it takes because for example for the plumbing all I had to do was pretty much scratch four inches down and I could lay the plumbing because that was already like I was already building up up from that level so I was going up not going down like implied here like here I would go have to dig that water line and plumbing line down through what I built up so just just details I mean they all add up to time um, and this is kinda uh, we'll, we'll get to that later that's the shot how the shower is gonna look so then here we're still at this um, the it's the devil's in the details because after you do this build up you have to tamp you have to get your tractor in there and co compact it either with a tamper or like a tamping machine uh, so there's like too much so in a, what we ended up doing the, the simplification there was uh, I think we're here 
The simplification was no. That's still still not. This is the earliest on top is what what we ended up doing. So we're on, we're on a on a on a grade. We just did the gravel to to raise it up. It's not soil. So then we're like pretty much at the surface. The surface is what we built up by putting a bunch of soil there because it wasn't even. We 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 did dig that pond and put a bunch of soil there to grade it. But after this point where you got this grade, it's relatively easy. All you do is put your pile of gravel in the middle, you put your foundations on the sides, and the digging is minimal. With a simple post hole auger and a shovel, and probably about four hours, like two to four hours of heavy digging, which is, I mean, that's, a, that's very heavy, but I probably did like two hours or something. I would get tired. But uh, it's a minimal way that if you don't have any equipment, like a backhoe, you can do it by hand. So this is... Uh, this you can do by hand. Um, use the tractor to dump the gravel in from the pile. You could do it also by wheelbarrows, but that's basically what happened. So, any questions on this? Or any questions from remote? And this is something we'll actually do. This is a simple way to. Now this is a slab. You could also do just a simple footer, which means you put your walls on it, and the inside is empty. But then the next step there would be okay. What do you do for your floor? So here we've got the floor and the the foundation at the same time, and then we polished we polished it a little bit, and we're going to just seal it with concrete sealer to get a finished floor. That's what we're doing. So we actually did get buffing pads for polishing concrete, and polished concrete can actually be very attractive. You can actually naturally on the wiki. The, you can cut the aggregate so the, the, the gravel, so it's like cut stone. How about that? <clears throat> That's what we could do. We don't have this level of finish, but we're gonna get it shiny just a little bit. Um, we're just so there's a difference. Like here, if you use very fine grit, you don't even have to. There is uh, with polished concrete, you can get away with. At the end, you don't even put anything on it. Or no, there's still there's still a hardener at the very end, but there is no th you nothing a, like. You put a sealer. sealer. Uh, well, you put a. Um, Jeff did this yeah. for a bit. He did polished concrete. So it's almost like putting a stain. It's a uh, what do they call that? It's to protect it. But you you spray that on there. But that's to, a hard thing. It's not a. It's to keep things from sinking through because you've got open porous concrete, so yeah. you don't want anything sinking through. Yeah. And then that's it. Or you can put wax on it, just like you would wax a floor in a store, and you can strip and wax it if you want to to protect it. But if you get to the fine grits, uh, the way I understood it was the, what we're doing right now. You don't need a shine. Yeah, you don't it, need a, It has its own shine. It has its own shine already, like literally, and then you're just sealing it. Whereas what we have right now, we didn't, I mean, it wasn't level enough to get it the perfect finish because, you know, we're doing it for the first time. And they make a machine, so I, I sold these machines and, and worked on them. They make a machine that's got a head about this big, propane powered, and it, and it's super, super heavy. <clears throat> and you've got all these little pads, similar to the diamond pads that you'll see over the shop, but they're about uh, three or four inches of diameter. And you stick them on these plates, and then the plates are, are kind of working. They're spinning one way and rotating the other way, going around. <clears throat> and you go over and you step through the grits, and you, you get on the heavy grits, and you cut into the concrete, and you cut that your gravel so that you have actually looks like cut stone it looks like marble it, yeah it is uh, you'll I mean your gravel you know is different sizes so you'll have different sizes of gravel that's at the surface and you'll just cut right into that and it is very very beautiful yeah so right now what we're gonna do is simply concrete sealer which is if you didn't do a good job in natural shine you can put a sealer on this which you have to reapply every every 10 years or so with the natural shine of it being actually smooth like marble that's there forever so this is preferred like t terms of lifetime design that's actually uh, that's one way to get lead or actually living building cha challenge for natural material concrete if it were solar concrete is completely regenerative uh, but I mean right now it's associated with fossil fuel so it's not that great but even lead and living building challenge considers it as a green material because of its longevity 
so it'll be there forever like hundred or more years um, that's about it what I got on that um, any questions on on foundations in Indonesia they don't actually put concrete they build up the foundations using rock mm -hmm. big rocks mm -hmm. all the way around and then they just fill it with sand with um, soil Mm -hmm. and then put uh, um, concrete on that? No, no, no concrete. Uh, tile. Tile. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, tile. so you compact the earth underneath? Yeah, you compact and then you just put the tile. Is there, is there clay underneath there, or what is that? Uh, I suppose it's pretty clay. clay. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. So then it's just a quarter inch thick, yeah. the thickness of the tile. Mm -hmm. That's standard for like all like residential construction or yeah yeah I think it's pretty much standard. I know I've seen Ken Kern did some experiments where he took and a and he he only had a one inch thick um, slab. Uh, he he had his stem wall that the walls were sitting on, but the interior he only had one inch thick and he took and hammered in a a crowbar. And rotated it around to make a cone-shaped hole, you know, about that deep. So then, whenever he filled it in, he had all these little piers. Basically, he was just saving concrete by doing piers that. of gravel. Uh, no, piers of, of concrete. So, in other words, you've got all these oh, little see. cones, you know, about that far apart all across the thing, which oh, that's a lot. Like how big? Uh, just about that I big see. around down to a point. So yeah. it's the length of a rebar. Mm -hmm. So he'd hammer it in, bring it around, go to the next and hammer it in, bring it in. And then he only left room for a one inch slab. So when he filled it, it goes down into those things and gives all these little points of support. So you're not bridging. How much concrete are you saving by that? I don't know. It seems like a whole lot of work for a little bit of right. saving. Uh, it's with my. Since how it sounds. <laughs> I get the concept, really but that's a lot of work to get mm. all those holes right. nice and tight like that. Um, well, yeah, but the saw goes all over the place, so you got to take that saw and you're moving it out. Well, you and I both have his books that, where he details that. Okay. Uh, but I didn't read that I, part. What's his name? Ken Kern. You're, you're welcome to borrow my book. I've got several books by him. Okay. Any other questions? K E R N. All right. So let's keep moving on. So let's let's review and practice what we did yesterday. So uh, I want to see what where the blocks are to the process we were doing. Um, so we're working on CAD on the modules and trying to put them positionally correct so we have a final model that actually is complete in the positional correct position so can somebody describe that process what we did and replicated so did you guys actually try moving those into positionally correct locations any modules into positionally correct but didn't upload it did anyone get that far or people are still just working on the modules I'm still working on the modules yeah, mm -hmm. yeah I was trying to put one number two next to one number Okay. Because the interesting part about that whole workflow, so to summarize that workflow, uh, let me share the screen again. So the workflow, uh, go back to our CAD for Seed Home 2. So we what we talked about yesterday was here's a file, this house location file, which we're just defining a coordinate system for where everything goes. And then as a person finishes their wall module, they can locate it on that rectangle with the XYZ being at the bottom left corner, like in a Cartesian system where you're looking, the, the orientation is defined by the front of the house. So the idea there was, how do you avoid conflicts? Well, first of all, we're allocating roles within our spreadsheet. So, okay, no conflicts there. We got to make sure we keep to our spreadsheet that has the role allocation that should be in our, let's see, do we have that? 
readily available in our document it should be at the very least so say day six or day seven uh, so if we go to day six I know we had it there it should be on today's day so coordination spreadsheet uh, no we don't have it there there's let's go back to day six the spreadsheet was the we found that we, we think that's probably the best way to organize uh, where is it down there uh, so status build sheet we added two columns where we're, sa we're saying in order to avoid any conflict on actual CAD because we started this the spreadsheet for the actual build we added column I and J for the CAD and the person doing it so when you do this put your name next to whatever you are doing so that another person is not working on it at the same time um, that's that's the only rule here and then then in case somebody has uploaded a new file to the final positionally correct file like we're talking about the pos positionally correct assembly is this one here so this this first one uh, which has two modules in there so this is actually module number one and this other one here is is actually 18 that's the first window um, but that's all we have in there uh, in order to not conflict within that file the concept there was download before you uh, before you upload to this so this is our assembly file here this is where you're uploading your finished product right now it's just got this master file here uh, there's only one which actually makes me think that I probably forgot to upload the one after I got the window because there's only one file here um, but before you upload to this one it's a good idea to download it right before you upload it because your chance of actually uploading at the same time as another person is not too high I mean unless you have many many people uh, if you have many many people you want to divide to many modules but any time one person should be working on one uh, if, if there's a rapid flurry of uploads to this uh, you might get into a little conflict but uh, but it's easy once you have things merged into this file to remerge if somebody had a conflict with it because because uploading on a wiki here two people can in principle upload at the same time uh, so this is uh, a little awkward but if we're working on the modules and allocating roles then we should avoid any conflicts here to allow multiple people to work on this like right now I did not have a conflict with somebody else uploading at the same time as I did if you have people working at different paces that's typically not an issue if you have a like a flurry where everyone's ready it might be an issue but just then just try again just re-upload it after the person finished theirs so if you fail just you can just go right again and download the one that was co was the conflict meaning somebody uploaded right in front of you just download that and add to that so it could be tag team in that manner um, so let's continue doing that today uh, try to finish the modules and uh, yeah, we need to get good at just um, the assembly so we can do this with large teams. And I, I think that's quite doable. You just have to get the hang of what this process is and go from there. Uh, so any any questions on that? Or Yeah. Let's keep going on that. David's joining us. Hi, David. So we'll uh, we'll pretty much cut out there. David, how are you there? Want me to run them? Yeah. Go ahead and do all of that. You got plenty of stuff on there. David, can you hear me? Yeah. How are you? I cannot hear you though if you're trying to are you trying to speak there? I can. I can. No, I, I first time using this. We cut out again. I'm, I don't know what's going on with this thing today. Um, Platform or something. How's your internet there? Because you're, you're cutting in and out. Can't really hear much. Mm. 
Yeah. Um. <clears throat> Let's see, David, can you speak or you're it's not working really? Oh, so actually I also ordered gravel for today, so we're going to get a gravel truck in here to do all the roads before the rains. And uh, so I actually have, um, just, just as a logistics note, I've got a eye appointment so at 3.30, so i got to cut out. I'm going to Walmart get me some glasses because my short, short vision is, is bad. I'm too farsighted. No pun intended, but... Uh, <laughs> I'm so visionary, my short term eyesight went bad. <laughs> uh, but I gotta do that because, I mean, I, yeah, that just happened so sudden so last yeah. year, man. It's funny. Um, I'm the same age. But, um, so I'm 49. Uh, I gotta do that, and then the gravel truck's coming, so um, if when they don't make it here by then, I'll, I'll leave a check for you so maybe, okay. maybe just sign that and can, yeah he's coming today so he should be, should be able to make it I told him to spread it all the way to Hab Lab and up to your house so just two trucks we'll see what how, okay. how much they last did you ask about the board in there he, did, he didn't want to do it <laughs> he didn't want to do it huh? nah, it was like I don't want to mess with that <laughs> couldn't get him to do it you probably might have gotten him but I don't know That's a, um, maybe so it's not other, common here I don't know it's not I mean because he said that a lot of times it's so wet that it just doesn't flow and it's typically a hard thing to do. Um, it could be. Uh, just Maybe you got a different kind of gravel where it's much easier or something. Mm -hmm. Here it's typically wet. Sorry, do you have a pen? I can just sign this and then... So this would be less meek. So um, July 7. Yeah, no, I do think you don't like this like texture. Yeah, so I'll leave this um, You'll be here definitely, so maybe I'll just leave this with you in case he comes after three. Okay. Um I'll go with the live track right now. Yeah. The, not the marker track. Yeah. And then I'll be at the shop. Yeah. And if he comes down here, I'll just write him another check. But he probably okay. catch you. Um, all right, sounds cool. Um, David, so is is your voice working, or is it not really?